right in. Um, you know, in full disclosure, pastors spend <laughs> probably too much time working to find creative, new, and fresh ways to bring God's word to God's people that it might be memorable and engaging. And I tell Misty this almost every holiday season, there's nothing new that I can say. And maybe in a sense, that's the point of holidays like Christmas and Palm Sunday and Easter and this evening being Good Friday, that it's our annual opportunity to once again tell the story and to remember Jesus in his work and what it's done. Frankly, it doesn't need my spin. It doesn't need any, any, any flavoring or nuance that I can bring to the table. How many are willing to believe that God's word speaks for itself? I just want to spend some time in his word this evening, and I want to bring you some texts. I'll add a few thoughts here and there. Some texts will be short, some will be a hair longer. But if you can give me in the Lord, maybe the best 25 minutes of your attention on this Good Friday, I'm hoping that it feeds you and that it sustains you and that it brings you some new insight, some fresh insight into the work of Christ. Some I'll have you turn to, some I will not. But when you turn to the end of the Bible, don't turn there. I'm just saying when you do. And you get into the book of Revelation that John the Revelator penned as he was inspired by the Spirit. He, he at different points, identifies Jesus in different ways. Sometimes he's portrayed as this lion, which signifies royalty, regality, majesty, and power. But in Revelation 13, verse 8, and I'm going to be reading from the NIV for all of these texts, John identifies Jesus as the lamb who was slain from when? For those who may know in the sound of my voice. The lamb who was slain from the foundation or from the creation of the earth. I have according to one commentator that the meaning here is not that Jesus was actually put to death from the foundation of the world, but that the intention to give him as a sacrifice was formed then and that it was so certain that it might be spoken of as actually then occurring. Whatever the cross was, it was by no means an accident. An occupational hazard for ministers as we read a lot of theology books and religious books. And it's interesting to me the number of contemporary, and by contemporary I mean the last one or two centuries, contemporary liberal theologians who will put forth this idea that the cross was the unintended end result of Jesus' ministry gone awry. He had publicly gone too far over his skis, and his death at such a young age was rather tragic and unexpected. Church, nothing could be further from the truth because according to John the Revelator, inspired by the Spirit, when was the, pl the plan first hatched that Christ be slain for us? from the foundation of the world. Do you realize that long before you were even born and even had the chance to commit your first sin, and long before this world was even made in a sense, there was a plan that was set in place for your redemption, my redemption, and the reclamation of the world. It's a pretty amazing thing when you think of it. We are beings who are limited to maybe 70, 80, some 90 or 100 years. I haven't met too many people who've lived beyond that. To deal with a God who is beyond time that sees the end from the beginning and he has this plan in place from page one from the jump in before, that's a pretty amazing concept. So this evening in the moments to come as we celebrate the wafer and we receive the juice, keep in mind that that plan was hatched quite some time ago in the heart of our Father. Matthew 26. If you want to turn there, I would invite you to. It's a slightly longer passage. Again, we're just surveying Bible tonight, believing that the Spirit of God who inspired it is going to quicken our hearts to receive it. That maybe some things are going to jump off the page to you particularly resonate. Matthew 26, the scene is Gethsemane. Verse 36 of that chapter. Judas was already in motion. The plan was afoot for his betrayal. And it says in verse 36 of Matthew 26 that Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And at this point he singles out three of them. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, along with him. And it says that he began to be sorrowful 
and troubled. And he said to them, and I want you to consider his words. He said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And I love this next invitation, and it's a tragedy that it went unheeded. Just stay here and keep watch with me. Who's ever been broken before? Life is just cruel. You're in the middle of a devastating crisis, and all you want is just for someone just to be there. Not to say anything, not to do anything, just a companion. In Jesus, in this moment of crisis, he knows what's coming, though the others are, are oblivious to it, despite the fact he's already told them what's set in motion. He just wants someone there. And in this place, it says that he goes a little further. And he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed. And if you read this in the, the account from Luke, it, it describes his, his sweat becoming as drops of blood, which seems like a, a, an image or a metaphor, but scientifically speaking, medically speaking, under incredible distress and duress, the capillaries in your forehead can begin to burst and quite literally blood begins to inter intermingle with sweat. And he begins to pray, and it's the first of three prayers, my father... If it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. And I'm quite happy that the text is not in there. And not as I will, but as you will. Of course, verse 40, he returns to the disciples and he finds them what? They're sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? Skipping to verse 40, 41. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away a second time and he prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken from me unless I drink it, once again, may your will be done. In verse 43, when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. Finally, verse 44. So he left them and went away once more. And he prayed the third time, praying what? Praying the same thing. This is a rare glimpse, if you will, into the true suffering in preparation for sufferings, if you will, in the life and ministry of Jesus. I have in my notes that we can, de we can discern or begin to understand the horrors of his imminent suffering by noting Jesus' reaction to it or response to it beforehand. He knows it's coming. He knows what's coming and what that is going to entail. And it begins to break him emotionally, spiritually, and beyond. This one text, this one section, it negates forever. Any attempt on our part to downplay or to diminish or to sanitize the event of his affliction and death. Rather, we do well to consider the cross for what it was a place of extreme torment, physically, emotionally, socially, and ultimately in the, in the work of Christ, spiritually speaking. Isaiah 53, just again surveying some verses. Isaiah 53, penned 700 plus years before Jesus came, prophetically is speaking to Christ and his nature and his work. It says, surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering. Isaiah 53, verse 4, the second part. We considered him being as though he was being punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. And he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. Verse 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. How many can say amen to that part? At some point in your life, maybe even now while you're here on Good Friday, you've been astray, you've gone astray, you may well be astray. And each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. If you look at the Old Testament words for sin, we, we covered this a few months ago on Thursdays. They're profound. This idea of missing the mark. God has set a goal or, or a, a guideline regarding how we're to be and we fall short of that. We miss the mark. We miss the target. This idea of that which is crooked or depraved. This idea of treachery, a betrayal, a fundamental betrayal of what he has called us to be and to do. Those words appear in this text. 
for whose crimes was Jesus penalized? Now, had you asked his adversaries, the earthly people who were responsible for putting him on the cross, they might have responded with his perceived blasphemies or disregard for the law, but the word is very clear that Jesus never committed any sin and there was no deceit found in his mouth or on his tongue. Ultimately, Jesus was on the cross not for his crimes, but for ours. Have you ever loved someone? I'm hoping if you're married, you do. I'm hoping that if you have children, you do. Friends, peers, coworkers, people in your life, they mean something to you. How many can say, yeah, okay, I, I fit that bill? It's a grievous thing to look them in the eyes when you've hurt them and they call you on it. When you love someone and you wound them or do something to wound them, whether it be knowingly, unknowingly, purposefully, or, or not, it causes the one who inflicted the harm pain. When I consider Jesus, I consider the wonder of who and what he is, and I've known him for 25 years now. When I think of all the moments he has proven good to me and faithful to me, when I think of him on the cross and he's there because of me, that hurts a bit. That's why I say on this Good Friday, maybe it should pierce our hearts to a degree as surely as Christ was pierced for us. This is not a light or a casual holiday. This is a sobering and a somber experience that we're, we're recognizing one who died, not just for us, but for me. And I don't know about all of you, but I know my own life fairly well. I don't even my own, know my own life perfectly. I've done a lot to put him on that cross. May that thought compel us to deeper levels of dedication in saying no next time you're so tempted to sin. 1 Peter 3, don't turn there. And again, for those who are nerds like me and like to read the notes, I'm only covering half of what's in my notes. It says in 1 Peter chapter 3 that Christ suffered once for sins. How many times? Christ suffered how many times for sins? Once. The righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. It's important that we recognize that the cross was a one-time act. It was sufficient to pay for the entire price for our salvation. God has done his part. He has done everything that he is going to do to make a way for us to come home. No further work is required. No further work shall be done which means that we have to determine our course of action in kind. Are we going to trust that one-time payment and trust that it was sufficient to really meet the requirement that God has to wipe out sin? Or are we going to be the kind of people, and there are many sadly in this world, who are going to choose to pay for the, the, the bill of their own sin on their own? Now, for those who choose wisely, and there is a wise choice, and I give you some friendly advice, you ready for this? Choose Jesus. His way is far better than anything that you can cook up. For those who are willing to trust in him, we are a people who look forward to his next and final work. The Bible says this in Hebrews 9. Christ was sacrificed again, how many times? Once to take away the sins of many. He will appear a second time. That's not me saying it. We're going to cover this a little bit on Sunday. He will appear again. Not to bear sin next time. The author of this book is very clear that when Jesus comes back, it is not going to be to once again offer himself as the payment for sin. He will not come again to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. On this Good Friday, as we consider the first and primary work of Christ, Easter culminating the work, how many of us are looking forward expectantly to his next work where our salvation, if you will, is finally complete? How many of you realize that because of the cross and our relationship with Jesus, we are currently in process? Everybody say in process. The work isn't done in your life yet. Everything needed to secure and complete your salvation has been taken care of. When Jesus said it is finished, he meant it. But the outworking of that plan is not yet complete and will not be until he comes back again. 
Right now, I'm in, a room, I'm in a room full of believers, and spiritually speaking, you've been born again if you've trusted him. Your inner spiritual being has been completely remade. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. But how many of you still have back pain or headaches or difficulties or circumstances that bring you down? When he is done, upon his return, he's going to finish the work. Oh, and it's going to be good. You know, when he says, behold, I make all things new, we haven't fully even begun to plumb the depths of that statement yet. There's so much in store for those who are believers. One of the reasons I choose to be a believer, and this might sound silly, I want to see how this whole thing turns out. Because those who were cast away and rejected, they're going to miss out on the greatest of all after parties. Friendly advice, stick around. He's been sacrificed once. Lay hold of that in your life and live with a sense of expectancy for the time he comes back. One or two more. And again, I know that I'm running a bit short on time. Turn to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Again, I'm giving you a lot of Bible. That's okay. Again, I'm just giving you different ways to approach the cross and understand or apprehend it. Hebrews 12, penned by the author. Of the book of Hebrews, we do not know who penned this one. Now, obviously, the verse 1, what's the first word? We're not going to go back and read Hebrews 11. But Hebrews 11 is the great hall of faith. It's all the people who did incredible things in previous times. In light of all of the people he's just mentioned, since we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in this sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance, which means this thing isn't a sprint. It is a marathon. I don't care how well you start. As a minister, I do care how you finish. So run with perseverance the race that's marked out for you, for us. Fixing our eyes on whom? What does it say according to the Bible? On Jesus, which means that the author is about to say he is the supreme example of what this thing should look like. He is the pioneer. He's the perfecter. Other translations, he's the author. He's the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him speaking of Jesus who endured such opposition from sinners so that you in your life, whether it was the first century or 2023, will not grow weary and lose heart. There's a lot in that three verses. Let me give you one thing to consider. The cross as a means of execution and torment, was to be a place of public shame, scorn, and derision. In being suspended between heaven and earth, it was an opportunity for passers-by to heap insults upon those who were being crucified. Most likely, he wasn't sacrificed on top of the hill, but at its base by the roadway so people could simply walk by and see criminals, in this case including Christ, being sacrificed. And we know per the biblical account that Jesus dealt with the heaping of abuse. Don't turn there. I'm going to read this to you quickly. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come on, save yourself. Come down from that cross if you're the son of God. And in the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, the religious elite and the elders, it says they mocked him, saying, he saved others. But he can't even save himself. Let him come down from the cross and then we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants to. For he did say, I'm the son of God. And it says at this point, even both rebels began to mock Jesus. One would go on to smarten up, the other would not. I ask a simple question, but there's depths in this, in the generation in which we live and in all generations. What enabled Jesus to endure such mockery and shame? I will tell you now, if I was the one on the cross and I had access to his capacities, none of them would have walked away. I would have jumped off the cross. And don't tell me you would have been so much better. 
Cheryl, you're small, but I can imagine you hopping off and a rolling pin comes out and they're all getting taken apart. <laughs> how did Jesus... How did Jesus endure it? Well, what does it say in the text? Who for the joy set before him endured. Well, what joy? It's fun to play with this. I have in my notes the joy of completing the task that was assigned to him by his father. He wanted to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Good job, son. Maybe the joy of imminent return to his father. How many of us realize that Jesus as God the Son loved God the Father? Loved him. I don't think we understand how much Jesus loves his father. If my father, as much as I loved my dad, told me to do it, and God the Father told Jesus, I probably would have asked for, for legal emancipation from the Foley family. No way. You're nuts, old man. But Jesus loved him. And after a 30-year span of time plus, though he had moments of prayer where I'm sure they had sweet communion, he finally got to go home. Many people say it was the joy of knowing that what he did and achieved would one day result in us being with him forever. You know, many of you who are parents, you love your kids. You love your family. You, you want to be with them. This Easter Sunday, we all make plans to be together because we love family. We love connection. We're even the kind of people that we're willing to expand the boundaries and the borders of our family beyond biology to where there are people you're not even related to, but you deem them family. Church is a huge part of that. Community is a part of that. God the Father is the same. Because of Jesus, we've been all adopted in. Those welcome around the table, and Jesus knew that that moment where he said it was finished, it was done. And in time, you would come, and I would come, and so many others throughout space and time. Now, this was not penned to just simply elevate Jesus, but to say this is an example of how this thing should look, because I hate to tell you, Christianity has not always been a popular faith, and it will not be at many times. You will face mockery, you will face scorn, you will face derision. I get nervous when I don't to a degree. What enables us to endure rather than just smacking people and going off as we shouldn't? Well, what about the same joys? The joy of completing the tasks that God our Father has assigned to us. You have a purpose and a plan, you know, and it's unique. There's no one else who was called to walk the path that you are uniquely called to walk, which means each of you in your own way are indispensable. That's why it breaks my heart that so many people feel themselves to be so insignificant and so unnecessary when they are eternally necessary in so many ways. And I don't know about you, but when I see him, I would much prefer to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, than depart from me. I never knew you. The joy of going home. Yeah, you know what? Mock me. Make fun of me. Dismiss my faith. We'll see who's right in about 50 years. All of the loud mouths out there in our world now, it is only a matter of time before they discover the truth. Prayerfully, they discover it before it's too late. What about the joy of knowing that to be absent from the body is to be present with him, and that when we die, even if we're killed for our faith, we get to see him. And I'll add, not just him, though he's obviously the center of the attraction. I'm relatively young, and there's already people I've lost I can't wait to see again. Some from this very assembly. Some from the previous. Blessed are those who are persecuted, Jesus said, because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Are people insulting you, giving you a hard time, diminishing your faith? Oftentimes it's in your own family, which is the most difficult because it's really hard to run away from family. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, as difficult as that may sound to apply, because great is your reward in heaven. Because you're in good company. That's how they treated the prophets and now the apostles and beyond before you. One more before we close with communion. I have 12 points. I've covered through six of them. 12 was a good round number. I knew it was too much. Final verse for now before we go to communion. 
The Apostle Paul says the following, and I think we can learn something from it regarding the cross and Jesus' work on it. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I'm going to repeat that one more time because that is a verse I have not fully wrapped my head around yet. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. We boast about a great many things. I have in my notes, I've covered these before, we boast about matters of prestige. How famous you are. I taught this recently at Stetson. I might have mentioned it here, and it's funny because the kids got the answer right, right away. When I was little, you want to know what a lot of kids my age wanted to be when I was like Jill's age or whatever? I want to be a police officer. I want to be a fireman. You ask kids what they want to be now, guess what they want to be? They just want to be famous. In particular, they want to be YouTube famous. I heard little Abby say it in the second row. They want to be influencers. They want, they want to boast about how many followers they have on TikTok or Instagram or fit. A lot of the sites no one in this church really goes to often, but it's a real thing. There are people who are legitimately YouTube and social media famous. Well, you know what? God bless them. But the day will come when their name is totally forgotten. It has an expiration date. There are people who boast in their power, how much capacity they have, how much authority. They were presidents, they were senators, they were, they were this office, that office. You know what? After a number of years, you'll be replaced. Fran Gromelski, if he's joining us tonight, Lord, may the, may the Lord bless you and your wife, Fran. He always had a line from the State House. Oh, I'm going to butcher it, but basically today they're a peacock, tomorrow they're a feather duster. He saw people in the state house, meteoric rise. We love a rising star, don't we? But you know what else we love is fallen, depraved, horrible people? We love when they inevitably crash. People, people, they boast about how much money they have. Nothing wrong with money. I hope you have a lot of it. Hope it doesn't captivate your heart, though. Be careful with it. Has an expiration date. Prowess. You may be the most gifted per person in your office. You may be indispensable, and tomorrow they'll hire somebody better who will work for less. I say this all the time, and I'm moving to a close with it. You may be beautiful today. I mean, there's only so many of us in this world. Sean Bear, look at that big smile over there. <laughs> Expiration date. Why do we boast in these things? And I get it, in the short term, it feels good too. We revel in these things. They become our identities, but the problem is when your identity is based on things that are transient and passing and fundamentally mutable, when they're gone, they're gone. And then you're left as a withered husk of a person searching for something to boast about. Can I give you some friendly advice? If you're gonna boast about anything, Boast about Jesus and what he's done for you and what that unlocks in your life because once you've received it by faith, this world cannot take it away. I've met people who were 95 and they're not nice on the eyes, but I would rather hang out with them than any Kardashian. Are the Kardashians still a thing, by the way? Or is, has their five minutes of fame passed? That was fast, wasn't it? I've, I've spent time with people who were broke I'd, I'd prefer their company to any millionaire that I know. There's something about Jesus when a person lays hold of him and they love him and their lives have a laser-like focus on him. It brings beauty to everything that they are and touch and it spills over. In your own time, read through Philippians 3. Because in Philippians 3, take that one home or download the notes Tuesday or Wednesday, Lord willing. The Apostle Paul begins to say, you know, I've had all of the earthy, earthly accolades and things that I thought were really working for me. I was of the right tribe. I was of the right nation. I was of the right religious, cl religious class. I was of the right educa education. He had all of the pedigrees. Everything from a human point of view was working for the man. But he said, once I came to Christ and I discovered him, all of that stuff that I used to think was so important, the more, the more 
contemporary translations say things like, I, I count them as rubbish. The real underlying word is much grosser. I'll let you look it up in your own time. Refuse, if you will. That's what Paul thought of all the things that at one point he thought were working for him. He says, now that that stuff is off the table and that's not my priority, all I want to know is Jesus. I want to be a part of a church, and we're not there yet, and maybe we never will be, but we can have a trajectory of people who just want Jesus, and they want to know him, and they want to experience him. I say it a lot, I don't want Jesus to us to be a, a character that we read about on, on our phones or in our paper Bibles. I want him to be real, so that when you speak of Jesus, it's not someone that you know of, but someone that you know. There's a gap between those two points. Can I make the recommendation? Prefer to know him and not just know about him. That was Paul's heart, Paul's focus, Paul's burning desire. May that be ours as well. I do close with this as we segue to communion. The Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth, I read this verse about once a month as we take communion, may we hear it afresh and anew, that I receive from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And if at this point you want to begin to open your packet, may the Lord bless you as you attempt to do so. I know they're difficult, but bear with it. You'll, if Jesus can handle the crucifixion, you can open your packet. For those who are at home, you'll have about 30 seconds to a minute. If you want to go get a piece of bread or a cracker or a wafer on this Good Friday, and you want to ready some, some juice or something, um, then feel free to do so. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, it says he took bread, and then he gave thanks. When he had given thanks, he broke it. Again, symbolizing a body that was about to be broken. So this is my body, which is for you. And then he gives this command. Do this in remembrance of me. Don't receive quite yet. I just want to hone in on that, on that simple request, command, invitation. Don't forget this. I can see the, the group of apostles there. Again, always oh, oblivious. Those poor guys. God love them. If you were down south, bless their little hearts. He knows what's coming. They don't. But even in that moment, he pulls them together around a table and says, this matters. Don't forget this. And can I tell you, all these years later, the church, the church of Christ has been doing this for quite some time. Because our Lord told us to and invited us to. Because it's easy in this world to forget what really matters. The important takes a back seat to the urgent and we forget. So to correct that, Jesus instituted this. He took the Passover supper which was already imbued with meaning and he gives it a fresh layer of meaning. Do this in remembrance of me. So this evening, as you hold that wafer, which represents a body that was broken just about 2,000 years ago for you, would you please receive? In the same way after supper, it says he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Again, covenants always required blood to begin. Do this whenever you drink it, once again, in remembrance of me. So please receive the juice. And I will close with this. The Apostle Paul says, whenever you or we eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. In other words, this is an opportunity for us to reaffirm and remember what Jesus has done. And we will do this until he comes. The day will come when Jesus returns to fully establish and inaugurate his kingdom. To that I will say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, as the biblical authors did. It's crazy down here. When you want to come back, fantastic. But until he does, we will remember and we should commemorate and consider.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity as family to come together, as fellow believers to, to recognize and consider the wonder that is Jesus. Lord, I've, I've, I've shared so many verses, and I don't know in each life which ones are going to resonate and impact, but I trust that your word will not return void. That as your word has gone forth, may it genuinely land in hearts that are fertile fields, good soil, waiting to produce crops and a harvest that will be, be pleasing to you. God, as we go our separate ways, I pray that we would remember the cross, but we would also live with a sense of expectation and anticipation that Easter is coming, and ultimately you are alive and well. Bless us as we go our separate ways. Keep us. God, make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us. Turn your face to us and give us peace. In Jesus' name.